that uh, wonderful music, and it is. And uh, not only is the theme upbeat and the tempo is upbeat, but the words are wonderful as well. Speaking of wonderful words, let's go to the Word of God. Psalms 94, beginning with verse 12. Blessed is the man whom you chasten, O Lord, and whom you teach out of your law, that you may grant him relief from the days of adversity until a pit is dug for the wicked. For the Lord will not abandon his people. Aren't you glad to hear that? For the Lord will not abandon his people nor will he forsake his inheritance. For judgment will again be righteous, and all the upright in heart will follow it. Who will stand up for me against evildoers? Who will take his stand for me against those who do wickedness? If the Lord had not been my help, my soul would soon have dwelt in the abode of silence. If I should say, my foot has slipped, your loving kindness, O Lord, will hold me up. When my anxious thoughts multiply within me, your consolations delight my soul. Those are good scriptures. My friends, I don't think anyone could deny that that's, that's a word from God that can really help us in difficult times. In Psalms 93, it's simply entitled, The Majesty of the Lord. But Psalms 94 is entitled, the Lord implored to avenge his people. Doesn't sound like that loving shepherd that we hear about in the New Testament, but it seems there are times whenever this prayer is uttered from the lips of godly people. As a matter of fact, we learn in Psalms 94 that the psalmist literally pleads with God to come to the aid of his people. And it's assumed that the psalmist is among them. So now it's not just them, God, but I need your help. Who will stand up for me, he said, against evildoers? Who will take his stand for me against those who do wickedness? To pray this prayer the way the psalmist did and really feel it in your heart, I think requires that you stand in the place of the psalmist that you take his place you must have felt the wrath perhaps of some powerful person or people who hate God and now they hate you because you love God and identify with those who worship him Jesus clearly reveals in his teachings why godly people often are the focus of persecution or discrimination or satanic opposition. Why it is that godly people are often the ones who face trouble in life and, you know, if you're thinking about the situation the Galler family is going through right now, you might ask yourself the question, now God, why does things like this happen? Or maybe in your own life, Surely none of us here have faced the kind of trouble that some people face around the world. But I'm thoroughly convinced right now, if, for example, if you were in the entertainment industry and you took a godly stand for almost anything, it's very likely your stock will go down in a hurry. Or if you're in the business world and you're contending for righteousness, and godliness in the way you do business. 
it is very likely that there will be voices all around you declaring that you are plain stupid. Or if you're a dad and mom and you're telling your teenagers or your junior high youngsters, listen, we're not watching this or we're not going there or we're not doing this thing, you're likely to be bet with, well, why and everyone else is and I don't believe this is fair and you're just mean to me and nobody loves me because of what you're doing and you go away feeling that way sometimes. Now, surely that doesn't compare to being thrown in a prison or being locked away in some dungeon. But if you're the one not invited to the party and you're 15 years old, it can feel pretty bad. Or if you're the one that lost your job or the promotion or the raise because of some godly position that you took, it can, it can feel pretty tough. Or maybe you're the one in the family that's simply never invited to the reunion because people feel uncomfortable about what's going to happen there if you're there. Or if you are invited, they just soon you leave real quick. Sometimes we wonder why difficult things happen, why persecution and discrimination and all those things happen to godly people. But then we read in John chapter 3 verses 19 and the verses that follow. These are the words of Jesus. This is the judgment, Jesus said, that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light. For their deeds were evil. Listen to this. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that, they, that his deeds will be exposed. You might wonder, why on earth would anyone hate Jesus? Well, here's the answer. Why on earth would anybody have a problem with a genuine Christian who's living a genuine Christian life? Right here is the problem. Jesus exposes the problem. In his teaching, Jesus clearly explained why people who practice evil hate him and will not come to him and accept his offer of salvation. Simply, it is this, they love their sins too much. And dear Christian friends, if we aren't careful, we might love our sins too much. We may become very comfortable with them and decide they're not that big of a deal. And tell the Holy Spirit to go off somewhere and be quiet. We can love our sins too much. But on the other side, Jesus said, while they love their sins, they don't want their sins to be seen for what they are. They want everyone in the bar to be as drunk and as morally depraved as they are. And that's what happens. But what the psalmist is referring to, folks, is Satan's hatred directed towards himself, that is the psalmist, and, and God's people. Remember Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill or a mountain cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You might think, well, of course, if they see our good works, they will glorify our Father that's in heaven. Or if they hear godly teaching, they will glorify our Father that's in heaven. No, the Bible said it's just the opposite because it exposes what's going on in their lives. And instead of glorifying God, they begin to say, well, you're nothing but narrow-minded and bigoted and, and you just don't understand. You're not culturally relevant anymore. You know, that's what... 
That's what the world says about the church today. If the church takes a godly position on almost anything, you're just not culturally relevant anymore. Let me give you some wise counsel, folks, as your pastor. God did not call his church to be culturally relevant. Make up your mind on that right now. We are not called to be culturally relevant. We are called to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth, a city set on a hill. And I want you to know something. This culture doesn't like the light that shines from that hill. That is, in major part, God's purpose for calling us and saving us. I want you to know something, friends. If you're saved, it's not all about you. Do you know that? I've heard people say, oh, preacher, I'll get saved when I'm good and ready. In other words, on my terms and in my time. But I got news for you, if that's how you're feeling this morning. God doesn't save you just for you. It's not all about your feelings or even your own needs. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we learn something about why it is that God saved you from your sins. The Bible said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that is, in advance, for us to do. God saved us to do something to be something, to carry out something. As a matter of fact, God saved us to create servants, His servants. Not only that, but the good things you have done because you love Jesus and you want to honor Him, God already had all those things laid out. Isn't that incredible? Before you were ever born, God already had those things laid out for you. Your faith, your charity, your sacrifice of love, every every resource God has made available, every minute you serve was a moment God gave you. Every dollar you gave this morning was a dollar that God has provided. Every morally right decision you've made was because the light of God's truth was able to shine in your hearts. We're to be reflections of the light of Christ. That's what causes us to be that city set on a hill. We are not the sun, folks. We're the moon. We don't produce the light. Jesus does that. But we reflect the light into a lost and dying world. But write this down. Just because you're serving God, if indeed you are, Do not expect an easy row to hoe. As a matter of fact, we should expect nothing less than the wrath of the dragon. The wrath of the dragon. To illustrate this, there's a a scripture that I've referred to in the past, and I'm going to bring it to your attention again. One of those great stories about how God works in people's lives. But it also reveals a lot about what's going on in hell right now. In Acts chapter 19, verses 11, the Bible said that that God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Now, we're going back to the first of that, that chapter, that God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or his work apron were even carried from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and evil spirits went out of them. You know, last Sunday evening, I reminded our church that our God is still a God of miracles, and He is. I recounted a story about a friend of mine that was serving down in Honduras, along with other stories, but this was very personal because I I know David Kelly and his wife Martha personally. I I broke bread with them. We've, We've shared a lot of meetings together. Uh, we, we've been together in, in uh, the General Association in different places. And he was a missionary for six years down in Honduras. And he said one evening there were some missionaries that, that was coming in, and they had come in, but all their luggage was on another flight. 
So they went on, they were a medical team, they went on to serve in southern Honduras. They said they would go back to the airport and get their luggage. So they cleaned out an old van, took out all the seats, went back to the airport, got their luggage, and started over those hills in Honduras to meet up with the missionary team. And David said he and David Zook was driving, and, and they were in this little old van and these narrow, high, uh, sharp, uh, roads in Honduras where there's absolutely no shoulder at all if you go off the road you go a long ways off the road he said we had just come up over a hill and just as we crested the hill we met two semi-trailers loaded with logs one was passing the other they had no place to go we had no place to go and no time to react and he said, I simply, what I remember doing was closing my eyes and clenching my fists and preparing to die. And he said, when I opened my eyes, I looked, and all I saw was the road before me. I looked, and I didn't see where the semis went. They didn't go off the road. We, 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 we stopped. He said, we finally just stopped. They didn't go off the road. We were uninjured. And he said, all I can say is either God flattened us to go under him or he lifted us up so they could go on. That's all I can say. There was no place to go. We should have been dead. When we got back, he said, neither one of us, David or I, never said another word to each other. We were just too overcome by what happened. We delivered the luggage, went back home. And after we were there a little while, uh, he said, his wife Martha said, uh, David, I don't know what was going on. He said, she said, about 6 o'clock last evening, I, I couldn't sleep, and God just called me to prayer right then. Right then. And he said, what time did you say? She said, well, it was about 6 o'clock. And he looked at David Zook, and they looked at each other and realized that was the moment that happened. My God is a God of miracles. My God is a God of miracles. And he worked a miracle in David Kelly's life. Why doesn't he work a miracle in every situation, every time, in every case? Why doesn't he heal everyone that's sick? Why doesn't he? I, I can't answer those questions, but I can tell you when God chooses to act, it is a profoundly wonderful thing that happens. And God was working in the life of Paul. And people were being healed, and people were being helped. And it was a wonderful thing to behold. And you would imagine in Paul's life, here he is in the ancient city of Ephesus in chapter 19 of the book of Acts. He's in the ancient city of Ephesus. He had just started his ministry there, and great things were happening. You might imagine that God would ensure that nothing would disrupt such a good thing being done in that ancient city. But I want you to know something. This good work got hell's attention. We know this because of the story of a Jewish Benny Hinn. Some of you may not know who Benny Hinn is. But this Jewish man had seven sons. And they were in business with him. His name was Sceva. And they had learned about the power in the name of Jesus from Paul's preaching. And they tried to use the name of Jesus for their own gain by casting out demons in the name of Jesus. They were being paid for it. It was very lucrative. So they went in and this man had demons in him. They were possessing him. And they went in and they said, in the name of Jesus, I order you to leave this man. But what happened was, the demons inside this man said this, I recognize Jesus, and I know about Paul, but who are you? They had no idea who these seven imposters were, along with their dad, Sceva. These people meant nothing to hell, but they knew about Paul. And they knew about Jesus. 
Well, before chapter 19 is over, we learn that a man started a riot in Ephesus. He started it because the gospel was cutting in on his money and his income, and Paul was nearly killed and run out of town. Have you ever noticed in your walk with Jesus that when you do something to really honor the Lord and really let the power of God be seen in you, that is often followed by a time of adversity. I have. Probably you have as well. I've noticed that trouble often follows triumph. For example, in Mark chapter in Mark's gospel, chapter four, Jesus began the chapter teaching by the sea. His popularity was at his peak. He had chosen his disciples, and they were following him. They were learning, and they were serving. And at this point, I am sure they felt so close to Jesus. It was wonderful. Like the psalmist, they would have believed that, that God will not abandon his people nor will he forsake his inheritance. For 400 years, the voice of the prophet had been silent. Then finally, John began to speak and preach. And people began to say, oh, God hasn't abandoned us. And then Jesus came. And here they were in the very presence of the Lord. And they must have felt as high as a kite. But as evening came, Jesus ordered them to leave the crowds behind and they got into a boat and with other boats they launched out on the Sea of Galilee. But with all the people in their lives, the important person was now asleep on a Roman's pillow in the stern of the boat. And wouldn't you know it, a storm arose. A horrible storm. By the way, in that day and time, they didn't understand that the cold air up in the Mount Hermon chain about, about dark or a little after dark very often would suddenly replace the warm air that comes up from the Sea of Galilee and it would swirl down the Valley of Doves with a horrible cyclonic action. And when it hit the Sea of Galilee, it would disturb the waters to the place that fishermen were thrown out of their boats and it was swamped. And you didn't see the... You didn't hear the thunder. You didn't see the lightning. It was just it, like it was invisible. And they often referred to this as the demonic wind. They believed the devil was behind it. Sure enough, I believe in this case he was. Because Jesus was in that boat. And his disciples were in that boat. And they'd been doing good all day long. But now the winds begin to blow, and these experienced fishermen begin to row with everything they had. But the Bible says the boat was filling up with water, and Jesus was asleep in the stern of the boat. Until finally, the disciples, in fear and exasperation and anxiety, went to Jesus. I'm sure about that time they would have understood what the psalmist meant when he said, when my anxious thoughts multiply within me. Teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? After a day of teaching and serving and walking with Jesus, now they stand at the threshold of disaster. Does God care? Does he care about the plight of Christians in India? or his servants who are jailed in Iran or North Korea or Central Africa? Or does he care about the Susan Gowler family? When my anxious thoughts multiply within me. It's one thing, folks, to face an external, visible opponent. It's one thing to deal with somebody you can see and lay your hands on or smack them in the mouth. Quite another thing to deal with the stuff that's in you. The anxious thoughts that hide in your soul. And you can't see them. You can't get your arms around them. But they've got you by the throat. They're choking the life out of you. You're scared to death. And it seems as if the God who said he would never forsake you is asleep somewhere. So they went to Jesus after this day of ministry. 
And they said, Jesus, don't you care that we're perishing? But at just the right time, in just the right way, Jesus stands up and he says, Shalom, peace. No man can order the wind around. No man has the power to control nature. We've tried, doesn't work. Imagine a man standing on the shores of the Gulf of Mexico and saying to Katrina, stop. Anyone would declare that person a fool. You can't do that. But instead of Jesus saying, roll a little harder, guys. Bail a little more water out of this boat. You better hurry before this thing sinks. Do a little more with your own effort to get through this time in our lives. Buck up. Be stronger. Be braver. Be wiser. Be something. Instead of saying any of those things, Jesus simply looks the wind right square in the face. That demonic wind that comes out of the valley of doves. And he said, peace. And you know what happened? The Bible says immediately there was great calm. Immediately. The psalmist said, if I would say my foot has slipped, your loving kindness, O Lord, will hold me up. Your consolations delight my soul. That's what happened. Very often we look with sympathy and pity on the plight of Christians in India, those poor people over there, they live such terrible lives. You know what? In eternity, we may envy them. In eternity, we may envy them. We look at people in Central Africa and, and we declare how horrible it is that they suffer so much. But in eternity, we may envy them. We look at people in our lives, in our culture, that go through divorce and they go through financial backsets and they, they go through horrible times. They, they emerge out of, out of addictions. They, they, they come through trials. They, they're, they're thrown into prison and they come out of prison and they're changed people. And we look at all of them and we think about how they've messed up their lives and how they've done all of these things. But if God gets a hold of them, folks, we may envy them someday. Because you see, eternity is going to make everything a lot different. When we truly see God's value system at work, when we are able really to see what it means or what Paul meant when he said that the sufferings of this life aren't worthy to be compared to the glory that God will reveal to those who, who love Him and serve Him. Who are these who have come, or I think it was John who was uh, standing amazed at what he saw. It was in the book of Revelation. What he saw was, was a huge group of people without number. And they had palm branches in their hands, symbols of victory. And they had on robes and they were dressed like priests and they were standing before God and they were praising God day and night. And there was a voice that came to him and said, Who are these people? And John said, You know, to the voice. And he said, These are those who have come through great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Imagine God, John going, I thought I had it bad, but now I see what God has in store for his faithful people. And in all eternity, they will be envied. Wow, look at that. Dear friends, let me tell you something. If you're going through a hard time in your life right now because you have served God faithfully and the devil is now beating you up, 
count yourself blessed because God has something in store for you maybe you're going through some suffering in your life right now maybe it's physical sometimes the greatest suffering isn't physical it's, it's mental it's inside of us it's those anxious thoughts within us and if you're going through one of those periods in your life right now and you can think back and you can say God I was serving you why did this happen Remember this scripture. And right now, you're, if you're thinking in your heart, God, I will accept you when I'm good and ready. I want you to know this. You're thinking wrong. God doesn't save you just for your benefit. God saved you so you can be a benefit to somebody else. That's the fallacy of the devil's argument that says, well, I don't have to go to church. I can worship God anywhere that's a lie first of all you probably won't secondly even if you stop and do it who's going to be blessed through your service who are you going to build up and strengthen no there's a reason for being here today folks and it's to help not only yourself but somebody else to pray for them to be with them in Sunday school to be with them in worship like this to love each other and to serve each other and to prepare for a week where we will be given the opportunity to love and serve people and the devil won't like it one bit and he will try to divide us he will give us every petty little reason he can but he won't do it because our God will not forsake his people as we ask for a song right now and give an invitation I am glad that God will not forsake his people. If I would say, my foot has slipped, maybe your foot has slipped. Still, the psalmist said, your loving kindness, O Lord, will hold me up. Your consolations delight my soul. Yeah, it does.